Tell somebody beside you they they look smarter than you do. Would you tell them that? Just <laughs> what a beautiful crowd here this morning. Look around, look around. God bless you. It's so good to see all of you here this morning. If you open your Bibles with me for the next few moments, I'm, I'm preaching from the book of Esther, the Old Testament book of Esther. If you can find the book of Psalms, which is pretty easy and turn left, you'll find the book of Esther. And I want to share today a message that God has laid upon my heart. This is the first Sunday of the month, and we started something at the beginning of the year. At 5 p.m., we have a Sunday afternoon worship and prayer service. It is unlike anything that we have ever experienced in the history of this church, to be quite honest. People come by the thousands. They come not to hear a preacher. They come not to be entertained, but they come to worship and pray and worship and pray. And, and it's the only thing I believe that can turn this nation and this world around. And it is so powerful what God is doing. I'll be leading that this afternoon at five and along with our team of worshipers. If you've never experienced what happens here, I want to challenge you to step up and step in to this season of prayer. We have no intentions of ever stopping it again. If you have your Bibles, I'm going to just highlight several scriptures for the sake of time. This is the story of Esther. Chapter one starts out in a beauty contest. The king is a bachelor and he wants a wife and there's 127 provinces and they send the most beautiful girl in their area to win the bachelor. That's not a new television series. It's in the Bible. And the one that wins the beauty contest is a girl named Esther. But then trouble comes and Haman, a killer, an evil, evil, wicked man devises a plan to destroy all the Jews. We pick up the story in verse 4. When Mordecai learned all that had happened, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, went out in the midst of the city. Listen, he cried out with a loud and bitter cry. He went from the front of the king's gate. No one might enter the king's gate clothed in sackcloth. And in every province where the king's command and decree arrived, there was, there was fasting, weeping, and wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. Notice verse 4, something I'd not seen before. And Esther's maids and eunuchs came and told her, and the queen was deeply distressed. Then she sent garments to clothe Mordecai. She sent garments to clothe Mordecai and take his sackcloth away from him but he would not accept them. Quickly move to verse 11. And there it says, she said, there's a law that says, I can't go in and fight for our lives. I can't go in and fight for the Jewish people because I'll be put to death unless the king extends his sepulcher. And then that powerful verse, verse 13, Mordecai told them, to answer Esther, do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than any of the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise from the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. It's amazing that this story starts out with a beauty contest. I think Esther is a type of the church. I believe she's a type of the last day church. I believe she's a type of the church and the culture of the church in the time when Christ, the King, will come again. And notice what she's consumed with. She's involved in a beauty contest. She's all dressed up. She's playing the role of queen. She's taking beauty baths, if you read it. She's relaxed. She doesn't want to get involved. She doesn't want to get in the controversy. She doesn't want to use her voice. She's silent. 
There's treacherous, dangerous things happening in the nation, and she is in a beauty contest. Sounds like the church, the modern day church, has beautiful buildings and beautiful music and beautiful people. There's the steeple, there's the doors. <laughs> Open up the doors. And there's all the hot people, the good-looking people, and they leave. It's a beauty contest. Culture is unaffected. Week, the whole week is unaffected. There's a beauty contest. But there comes a time in a nation, and there comes a time in the kingdom when God says the beauty contest is over. I believe we're living in that day when no longer can the church just be a beauty contest of beautiful buildings and beautiful music, but nothing changes. What amazed me is Mordecai gets a burden and tears his clothes and he challenges Esther to come out of the beauty contest and get in to the fight. The fight for the nation. The fight for the sons and the daughters, the children and the grandchildren, the generations to come that would perish. You cannot remain silent, he began to cry out. And I believe that there are thousands of pastors in America who need, I'm one of you, I don't put down and criticize pastors, but I'm, I, I'm given a call today. I feel like I'm an old man for a reason. I feel like I'm 59 and about to turn 60 this year, and, and I have the right. I've been pastoring the same church for 34 years. I have a right to speak like a father now. And if ever pastors needed direction, it is now. If we don't get involved, we're going to lose our children and our children's children. We're going to lose freedom of speech. We're going to use, lose freedom of religion. We're going to lose freedom of worship. We're going to lose it. It's not something you can just go through like a beauty contest and say, that's not my problem. We don't mix our faith with nothing. It's just, we're just here. What did Mordecai say to Esther? He said, you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this, not to be a beauty contested. And do you know when she heard that he had torn his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes, the next part of the verse amazed me. The scripture said, and she sent to him garments. Did you read that? Throw it up. She sent to him garments, new garments. She said, just put on some glad rags. Just cover it up. Just, just let the church kind of do their thing and sing the songs and preach the little message and everybody have burn some candles and do whatever you want to do and then just go home. Just put on new garments. Put on some glad rags. Just put a smile on your face. Just get up and preach the messages of seven ways to enjoy your vacation. And uh, we need more than that. The end times are happening in our times. If you can't see it, if you can't see the threat to freedom, if you can't see what is going on in the world, and it's like the church is totally disconnected. Families falling apart. Marriage is falling apart. Culture changing. Redefining of genders and all kinds of things happening. And people like Elon Musk, who's not even claims to be a Christian, he's fighting for freedom of speech while the church is quiet and doesn't want to offend and doesn't want anybody. May We might lose people. You came to the the wrong church. We are not that silent church. We have come to the kingdom. God has given us this to affect this nation and this world. We're not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's real. And I'm not, I'm not preaching today to get you whipped up. I'm preaching today to get you woke up. Real wokeness needs to hit the church. 
Just put on your glad rags and every Sunday come in here and play church and have a beauty contest. Don't affect anything. Don't preach anything. Don't stand for anything. Let generations perish. Let, let marriage be destroyed. Let, let culture disintegrate. Let the history of a nation that was founded has terrible things in its past, but it also has wonderful things like a civil war where men fought for the freedom against their own. They fought so that slaves could be free. That's in our history. This is so important that we not allow the culture to be redefined while our voices are silent. This week in America, a disinformation czar and board was appointed to determine what is acceptable and what is not acceptable concerning the things that you put on your post or I preach. It's a matter of time before I get banned. I've been banned before. They cut us off in the middle of services, but I guess they're going to really be watching. And it's not about me. But what they really hate is this book. What they really hate is what this book says. What they, it's really not anything but this book that they fear. I love it when Billy Graham used to get up when he was alive and he would say one thing over and over. If you watch any of his old clips of sermons, he would say, and the Bible says, and the Bi it doesn't matter what my opinion is of gay marriage or transgender. I don't have an opinion. My opinion is what the Bible says. The Bible says, the Bible says, I'm not going to be mean. I'm not going to be ugly. I'm not going to harassed, but you have a right to live like you live, post anything you want to post, but you don't have a right to cancel me and say, I can't say the Bible says. It's called freedom of speech, and it ought to unite every American to say, we will fight for this. Live any way you want to live. Live and let live, but don't say you can't have a voice, but I can. And I won't say I can and you can't. That's called freedom. But what touched me is Esther arose and I saw something else I'd not seen because the scripture said, she said, but you don't understand Mordecai. I can't go into the king because they passed the law. <laughs> you ever read that? Throw it up, guys. She said, there's a law that says I can't go into the king. And I love Mordecai's response. He said, you need to test that law if it's out of line with what God's telling you. And it's time to test some laws. When grown men want to get in your teenager's girl's locker room and bathroom, it's time to test that law. When... <laughs> I, I don't understand. I don't understand those. I, I, I'm not against the jab. I'm not against the, the needle. I'm not against the shot. I, I, I've had it twice. People in my family, my daughter, my, some of my people have had the, the shot. It's, it's, not a, it's not an issue for me. I don't care. What I don't understand is apparently COVID can be spread in, all over the place except at the border. If we would just go to the border... Apparently, you don't need a jab. You don't need a mask. You can come in great numbers by the millions illegally into the nation. You can bring drugs. You can bring criminals. You can bring gang members. Nobody will get COVID. Something is crazy going on. And while we sit back and in one month, an entire, I'm not against my precious Hispanic people. I love the people and some of them are precious and some of them should come legally to this nation. But what I don't understand is how is this happening? How can a whole city 
The city a size of Atlanta comes in illegally. We don't know who's coming in. They know of 50 on the terrorist list that are in this nation. And if they blow up your kid's high school, then maybe we will wake up. Then maybe we will realize. And the church is just in a beauty contest. And we're just quiet. And we don't know how to pray. And we don't need prayer meetings. And we don't need preachers to get up and we just want you to be non-controversial. I am non-controversial. There's one way. There's one truth. There's one life. His name is Jesus and all must repent. But even the Bible said, put watchmen on the walls and make sure you don't let just anything come into your nation. Well, I'm a watchman and you're a watchman and it's time to get on the walls and realize what's happening to our educational system. What's happening in our law system? What's happening when, when you go on mdweb.com, if there's anywhere you ought to feel safe is medicaldoctorweb.com and you see something that people with great intelligence and know the human body, on one of the first forms, if you want information, check your gender, male, female, neutral. And I'm not against the shot, but the same voices that scream my body, my choice, when it comes to abortion, Say no, but if you don't, you don't get my body, my choice. And if you don't take the shot, if you're a nurse and a doctor, a hero who saved lives during the pandemic, you are fired. And you say, that's not happening. We had two nurses, a man and, a, and his wife, both registered nurses in our campus in our OC. Both of them fired from Sinai Hospital in Los Angeles, fired because they worked all the way through the pandemic, received the highest accreditations at one of the most reputable uh, hospitals in the nation, but fired because they would not take the shot in their body. All I'm saying is this, that is a precursor of the mark of the beast. If you won't take, it was a trial run. It was just, will they go along with it? And if you don't, we don't care about your family nurse. We don't care about how, whether you put food on the table. We don't care if you get up and end up in a tent outside homeless. We want you to lose your salary. We want you to not be able to buy and eat and Take care of your family, even though you've been a hero and you've been working on sick people while we were sitting home watching Netflix. Come on, folks. I'm preaching the truth. Something is wrong. And we're getting more and more muzzled. This is not China yet. This is not Russia yet. And we refuse to sit silent. We have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. And it's time for the church to speak up. Speak up. I'm coming. <laughs> Isn't it amazing? In 1941, when Japan bombed Pearl Harbor and America was thrust into a world war, Hitler was on the move with his Nazi armies, destroying, killing, and massacring people, much like we're seeing in Ukraine. And Franklin Delano Roosevelt called together five business titans, the most powerful men in the nation. He called them together. They were, they were Walter Chrysler, founder of American Chrysler Corporation. They were Mr. DuPont, the manager of General Motors at the time and director, the board of directors for the Empire State Building. They were J.P. Morgan Jr. over J.P. Morgan and Company. He called them all in. We're going into war. This is serious. And he called in William Boeing, the founder of Pacific Airline Company, which would later become Boeing Airlines today. 
the largest aerospace manufacturers in the world. It would be the equivalent of, ca of calling in Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook and Jeff Bezo of, or I never get his name right, Bozo, whatever it is, uh, of Amazon. And it would be like calling in Elon Musk now of Twitter. <laughs> I'm going to get that man saved. That's my mission in life. I want him filled with the Holy Ghost. If you're watching me, Eli, you don't have a chance. The church is praying for you, buddy. Man, he ain't watching. You'd be surprised who have contacted me and said they were watching. You would, you would not believe. I've had Kardashians call. I've had people, I, I could start naming. I'm not, I don't do that. I don't get up here. I've had them come to the, when I preach out there, I've had them come to the church. Nobody's beyond the reach of the gospel of Jesus Christ. No amount of money can satisfy your soul. No amount of power can feel the emptiness that you have when you don't have Jesus. The Bible says, every knee shall bow. Ooh, I feel something up here today. Every tongue shall confess. So I want you to get this picture. FDR, President Roosevelt, calls these men. He had just won the election. Guess how he won the election? He won the election by slandering those five powerful business titans. He would, in his campaign speeches, call them robber barons. He said they, nothing new under the sun. He said, he said they, they were responsible for the Great Depression. He made enemies of all five of them. And now that America is going to war and Hitler is coming, he calls these business titans into the room. And his first assignment is, I've got you to somehow... I've got to get you to understand there is a clear and present danger and you, your corporations will cease to exist. Your families will cease to exist. Your wealth will cease to exist. Your employees will cease to exist if this enemy is not stopped. I just want to say today that the censorship that is starting small, but it always takes more ground and more ground and more ground while the people just sit back and let it happen. What they really hate is not the church as a historical building in their city. They hate the preaching of the Word of God. And when you understand what he said to them, this is what he said. He said, I need you now to unite. We no longer have the luxury of disunity. We no longer can be left wing, right wing, Democrat, Republican, black, white, Asian, Indian. We can't do that. We must come under one thing and understand our very existence is on the line. If we're going to preserve this nation, if we're going to preserve the Constitution, if we're going to preserve the freedom of speech, the freedom of worship, the freedom of, 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 of whatever it is, the justice that we desire, even though it's not a perfect system, it is the most close thing to perfection of any government on the planet and in human history. The nation that you live in is a great nation. The nation that you live in still says you can dream and you can do. And I realize there are disadvantages. Not blind to that. Understand that. But somewhere we have allowed teachers, unions, and leaders of those unions to erase the good history of America. And they said, if you don't get in this fight and we don't create the war machine of freedom, we'll lose it all. 
And the same applies to the pastors that will not stand against the lies of censorship. I love what Mordecai told Esther. He said, there's a decree to kill all the Jews. And she said, well, uh, the law says I'll die if I go in without permission. And Mordecai just kind of looks at her and says, um, you're going to die because you're a Jew. Now, if you go in, you got a chance that he might hear you. But if you don't go in, you're going to die. I want to say it's coming to your family. It's coming to your home. It's coming to our state. We are watching things before us and we just sit quiet and nobody says anything. And we come to church and we hear another thing and blah, blah, blah. And I, I don't know. I just feel like if I've got any influence, I, I'm so old. I don't care anymore. I don't care. I don't care. And COVID so wrecked the church that I used to preach the empty seats every week for almost two years in this place. We just recorded and, and, and nobody came. You, know, you didn't need to come. And, 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 I've, and I, fit, I guess I've been there and now it's full again and this is awesome, but I don't preach for crowds. I preach because I realize that I'm going to stand before the Lord one of these days and I cannot look my children and my grandchildren in the eye and say, I left you a nation without freedom of worship, freedom of speech, freedom of prayer, freedom to speak up and say the Bible says. The Bible says, turn to somebody and say, the Bible says, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not lie, thou shalt not have no other gods before thee. The Bible says. Thou shalt honor thy father and thy mother. Thou shalt remember the Sabbath and keep it holy and get your rear end back in church. Edit. Playing games, right? Just like Jesus said, they'll be going, giving in marriage, taking in marriage, having entertainment, going to the mountains, going to the beach. When suddenly in an hour that you think not the son of man cometh, he's coming just like he said. It, we're on the verge. The Russian bear is on the move, just like Ezekiel 38 and 39 said it would happen. Just like China is become a prominent force. He said the kings of the east will unite with the kings of the north, if directly from Jerusalem, if you look on a map, totally north is Russia. Russia. What it, Iran is mentioned in Ezekiel 38. When Russia starts moving, China will come alongside them. They have not been silent since the Soviet Union has been dismantled. They've been pulling together their extreme Muslim nations like Syria. Did you know that Russia has an airport with their fighter jets in Syria? Do you understand that Syria is bordered right up to Israel? And that is the battle of Gog and Magog. And is it, is it going to happen? Is this the one? No, I don't believe this is the one, but I believe it's the spirit, the, the antichrist spirit stirring President Putin of Russia to get the armies ready to keep moving and start the march because they're really not fighting and hating the Ukraine. They don't know it. There's a demon that hates Israel. I got to quit, y'all. I, I, but, but you got to understand, the end times are happening in our times and the church is in a beauty contest. I'm worried that we might be too strong well, you got a choice to make, preacher. You can either be a strong preacher of the Bible, or you can just be stupid. Because the Bible said that the person who knows the truth and sees danger coming, this is in your Bible, a verse in your Bible, it said, it's like a dumb dog that won't bark. The idea that being silent in the church won't divide your church and hurt your church. 
Well, I've been doing this for 34 years, and I guess I'll divide it again and hurt it again, but I'm going to preach the truth of God's Word. It's right. It's right. This book, this book is right. FDR had the same argument that we must make. I don't care if you're Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian. I don't care if you believe in water baptism, sprinkle, or spot removal. I don't care. If you are a Christian, it's time to mobilize. And here's what happened. Let me tell you what happened. They turned their factories into the war machine. Now, don't get me wrong. Our battle is not with flesh and blood. We're not to go out and fight people physically and tear up buildings and tear up streets and tear up Congress and tear up anything else. Our battle is not with flesh and blood, but we are to become the spiritual war machine on our knees, praying and calling out. The fact that there's a church where there could be thousands of people tonight at five o'clock who are not coming to be entertained. They don't need another nice sermon. They're here to talk directly to God and cry out for their children and their children's children. It makes hell tremble. And they started building and they said, what's it going to take? And this is what blessed me. What happened was they turned their factories into war machines, producing millions of grenades and millions of rifles and bullets. And guess who was making them? The biggest supplier to the forces in the field in World War II, 14 million women said, you are not going to take my Bible, Hitler. You are not going to take my nation. You are not going to have the minds of my children and put your little swasha on them and tell them who they are. I will not allow it. And women by the millions rose up and started producing. Listen to this. At Ford Motor, they were cranking out B-25 bombers one an hour. One an hour, 24 hours a day. Women were creating seven ships a day across the nation. Warships. I'm not interested in producing warships. I want worship. I want some women of God who will say, I will fight for my children. I will fight for my school board. I will fight for what you are telling my children about that book. I want that book to be honored. That's how you make America great, is you gotta make God great. Fourteen million women. They created and built the machine of freedom. Whew, what a picture. Tell somebody it's not about you anymore. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I know you're young and I know that you all, you've been robbed already of a lot of fun and partying stuff. You know, COVID was just terrible. And I, I don't make light of that. I mean, the mental illness, the, the depression, the loneliness, the disappointments, the shut doors because of COVID. I, th I see you, but I see tens of thousands of young people that are wrestling and it's very real, very real with depression and hopelessness and just loss because they lost those two critical years. If you were a senior or junior in high school, the scholarships went away. The ball went away. Everything went away. And I wish that I could tell you now it's going to get easier, but really what Jesus predicts is in Matthew 24. It's not that we've never had wars. It's not that we've had rumors of wars. It's not that we've never had pestilence and famines. All those things Jesus said, you'll know you're in the end time. But he says it's going to come with greater intensity and frequency. It'll be like one after another, after another, after another. It'll happen quicker and quicker and quicker and quicker. We're in it. 
Just, and he gave the analogy in Matthew 24 of, of a woman giving birth. And just like the birth pains start, and then she can go around. And uh, Sharice was telling me uh, that there was somebody who was giving a speech, and she showed it to me on her phone. And this woman was giving a speech, and, and her water broke and everything. And, 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 she, and, she, and she was pregnant, of course. And, and she, and she uh, anyhow... But, but she took her time was the amazing thing because, and then every once in a while she would stop and she would, and she would, and, and, and the crowd would go crazy because they knew what was going on and the crowd would, but, but then it started getting closer and she, she said, I got to go. <laughs> Turn to somebody and say, we got to go. We ain't got much time. Ooh, are you good to go? Are you ready? Are you ready? And I guess what I would want to say to you is I wish you could go on vacation now. I wish you could just kick back now that you got your degree and everything. Now that you've been through COVID and all that, you deserve a break today. But the Lord is saying to every one of you, will you be my Esther? Will you, you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this, not to be a party animal. Well, that's what all my friends are doing. That's what I'm preaching about. You cannot be a part of the beauty contest. You don't have the time that my generation had. And I know that's unfair, but it must be that God trusts you more than he trusted my generation or any other generation. Because it is very, very obvious to people who study that Bible that these are extremely unusual times and it's happening with more frequency and intensity. Boom, boom, boom. One thing after another. Putin is now threatening the Russian president, threatening nuclear. If America allows the Ukrainians to get jets, I'll use uh, either a cyber war. You know, we could, we, we act like we're just immune. It could never come to my home. They could knock our power grids out tonight. No one in this room is immune. So what are we to do? Run to a cave, run away. God's not running and I'm not either. So what are we to do? What we're doing tonight at five o'clock, get on our knees and call on God and gather in services like this and let the Holy Spirit tear down the walls and renew our faith and set us on fire. Awaken our soul, open our eyes and take the scales off. I found this on the internet. Uh, actually, actually, I'm, I, I stand corrected. I looked for something on the internet, and I remembered that the, the church that we sent three hundred thousand dollars to, and we're sending another three hundred thousand this month in Ukraine that has eighty something campuses. This is one of their campuses. Now, get the picture. They are in a bunker. They're in a refugee camp. These people have lost everything. You enjoy your home. You sit there, and it, but they have been run out of their home. They've lost their cars, their jobs. And it was not some, you would, I've been to the Ukraine so many times. I've been to these cities. These are normal. It was normal life, just like American life. Restaurants, schools, everything. But this is what we do as believers when the bombs start going off. They may not be, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. They may not be physical. They may not be physical drums, bombs going off in your family. But all of us have had spiritual bombs hit our family. Take them out. Drugs, alcoholism, try to destroy our homes, our families. What do we do? Number one, we pray. And number two, we worship. Now watch this. Hallelujah. Tack, Herre. Tack, Herre. Tack för Ukraina. 
Tack för vad du gör i Ukraina. Tack för att vi skyddar landet här. Vi skyddar landet. Vi skyddar människorna. I Jesu namn. Amen. Stand up on your feet. Raise your hands and say, I have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Every dad must enlist today. Every mother, every woman of God, regardless of your age, must enlist. Every teenager must enlist today. Every grandfather must come out of retirement. Every grandmother must get on her knees again. Because he's coming again. And there's a whole generation that must be reached. And I don't know how to do this altar call except to say, if you're searching today and you're confused and you don't know what's going on, but you felt something in this service and you would like to know before you leave this place that Jesus Christ is your Savior. You would like to know that your past is forgiven and you are a new creation and you are in God's plan of salvation. If that's you, boldly raise your hand right where you're standing. I want to pray for you. There's hands all over this room. Keep raising them high there, there. Yes, up in the balcony, wherever you are, wherever you're watching at every campus. Those of you watching by television right now, I don't believe you watched this program today by accident. I don't believe that you just tuned in and stopped. Something arrested your soul. You may be sitting there with a bottle. You may be getting high with a joint. You may be so discouraged and you may feel like taking your life because your family's in shambles. Your marriage is gone. Maybe you're on top of the world and it feels so empty. Jesus loves you. He knows your name and he's come to your house, your, your apartment, wherever you're viewing this telecast. Everybody in this room and everybody watching by television, just raise your hands toward heaven and repeat this prayer after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I bow my knee to you. I surrender to you. I realize the time is short. I realize that you're coming again. And I realize that I need you as my redeemer. Forgive me. Say that. Forgive me. I put my faith in you. You nailed my sin and shed your blood on the cross. And today, the Bible says, I'm forgiven, I'm chosen, I'm called, I am a new creation, I am free indeed, in Jesus' name. Give the Lord the biggest praise you can. Can we raise our hands and worship? We're gonna let you go in a minute, but can we just sing this song and worship? You are holy. Nine and 
one o'clock and it's going to be so powerful ladies it's all free but why don't we kick it off with prayer this morning a beautiful celebration of mothers next sunday but why don't we start by praying for our families i want little jack to grow up in a nation that's free to worship Come on, ladies. I believe that you're the ones that have carried the church. You're the ones that have, that have bought our buildings and done so much. And we honor your prayers today. Come on, raise your hands all over this room and seek the face of the Lord. If we don't let the word change us, nothing will change us. We'll stay in a rut and miss the coming of the Lord. Pray. We pray. We worship when the bombs are falling. We worship when all hell is breaking loose. This is how I find my battle. This is how I find my battle. You know what? You're free to leave anytime you want. Don't feel this bad about it. We're so honored you came today and just, just take off whenever you need to leave. But we're going to stay right here just a minute. Everybody in this house, lift your hands and say, This is how we find our battle. For our nation, for our freedom, for our faith, for our Bible, for our marriages, for our children. Oh yes, Lord. Come on, church. Tonight at five o'clock, we're gonna pray like we've never prayed. This is how I fight my battle. This is how I fight. I'm going to. As for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. Decree it. Declare it.
I want you, I want you to end with the Lord's Prayer this morning together. Pray for this nation. Pray for Ukraine. Pray for Russia. Many, many, many precious, precious people. And the rest need Jesus. They're not our enemy. They need Jesus. Some of them have never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. So lift your hands and let's pray together. There's such power in united, concerted, corporate prayer. Ready? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. Lead us not back into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine on you, be gracious unto you, lift his countenance upon you, give you peace. I mean, if you believe that what we're doing, do you know we've committed a million dollars to the Ukraine and we're halfway to that goal that we've sent over. We'll send another 300,000 and then another 200,000. You can help us with that as you give, as you support this ministry. That's the beauty, folks, of operating off the top and not scraping the bottom. People criticize big churches, but big churches can do some big good in the world. And we're not scraping off the bottom. We operate off the top, and it's a blessing. He made us the head and not the tail, above only and not beneath. Keep us up here. When we, you know, when you give a million dollars plus all the other stuff you got going all over the world, it's a lot of money to anybody and to any ministry. And it is for us, but we are cheerfully and gladly sowing to those refugee camps all over the nation of Ukraine. We can't do everything, but we can do something. So give online. They're giving stations out back. Thanks for being a part. We love you so much. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Did I do that? Make it, I already done it. Then it's all good unless you need it again. Some of you need it again, but whatever. We'll see you. Love you. Five o'clock. See you tonight. Such an honor to have all of you with us. God bless you. Thank you for worshiping. I'll be down here if you from out of town or whatever, and you'd like to say hello. And uh, I, I don't have anywhere to go. Sharice is with the rest of the family somewhere. <laughs> We're all over the place. I'm just one lonely guy. And uh, I'll, I'll be down here and I, then I'll eat at McDonald's or something. No, I'll eat at Zaxby's. That's where I'll go today. <laughs> or Chick-fil-A is closed. Amen. What a powerful service that was. Today, if you've made the choice to be saved, we want to say congratulations and we invite you to text the word yes to 510-510 just so that we can personally get connected with you. And if you need prayer for anything at all, please text the word prayer to 510-510 as well so our team can get connected with you. Yeah, and it's such an honor to partner with you in prayer. So feel free to text those numbers because we see each and every one. I want to echo what Pastor Jensen just said. Thank you for your generosity and giving. It allows the... Uh, for the Bible says, right, like right, you right. talked about earlier, this type of ministry yeah. to go forth into over 260 countries and, uh, and beyond. So we're Thanks. so grateful. Hey, listen, before we pray, again, we want to invite you tonight, 5 p.m., whatever platform you're watching on, join us right back here at 5 p.m. Eastern. We'd love to connect with you. And then during the week, follow us yes. on social media. You can get daily encouragement through, through the things that are posted online. Make sure to download the app, go through those daily devotions. But I wanna pray and send you on your way today. Lord Jesus, we thank you for each and every person watching. I thank you for the moms, the dads, the grandparents, Lord. Those that are, that are almost, you know, relinquishing hope 
Maybe they're, they're stretched so far, God. I pray that you would grant them peace. I pray that you would give them freshness and encouragement in Jesus' name. All of us, we set our eyes on Jesus, the author, the pioneer, the perfecter of our faith. We set our eyes on you, Jesus. Give us strength for this week to go out and to be a light to others. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We'll see you guys tonight. Bye, y'all.